Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Phil Craft Survival Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by SIG. I just got done with a hunt in Wyoming and used the new Zulu 6 stabilization binos. You can pick those up everywhere SIG binos are found. What I thought was really interesting is those integrated into my gear really well, including my 20 liter that you could put on your back via the back strap that allows you to carry it like a sling bag. Really cool to see the integration of partners and sponsors of the podcast with everything that Phil Craft Survival does. Now back to the podcast. Um, one of the objectives I set for Mission Resilience is getting guys who have a life story, not necessarily of accomplishments, because the most resilience is based on failing, but working through at that adversity. Um, Chad Robichaud is no stranger of failing and working through adversity. He's that guy. And he's gone through a lot of um, experiences. The focus for this particular piece is Ukraine. Now, if you're listening to this fresh to it, we just talked about Save Our Allies and the rescue uh, for Aziz, one of his operators that he operated with in Afghanistan on the Black Rifle Coffee podcast. That's available. Um, it, they launched the same time, so you can go over to Black Rifle's podcast right now and hit that up. Also, if you subscribe to Phil Craft Survival, the link's down below, or we might even sublink it. If you subscribe to our newsletter, you're the first to know about these things when they release. So make sure you go ahead and do that. Say, shameless plug for us. Um, Chad, let's talk about Ukraine. Yep. One, it's super controversial. Even my own opinion of Ukraine is flawed because I don't have a lot of the information. Mm -hmm. um, we just approved a budget of $1.7 trillion by at least the things that I've read um, $45 billion between Ukraine and NATO, but about $45 billion in additional funding for Ukraine. Puts it puts a total of about $111 billion. Yeah, a lot of money, right? Yeah. Yep. And and that's exactly right, right? It's, it's over $100 billion now. And a couple instances over the course of your 10 now rotations since last year yep. um, to Ukraine, uh, we've talked back and forth about we even wanted to do an overland thing yeah. with X overland to Ukraine, but we, we established that it was kind of not the time because right. it was a little dangerous. I personally don't agree with funding Ukraine without a clear strategy. I think we've made that mistake. Me and you have been in, in, a global, in the global war on terror, both with OGA and the military, kind of seen the best and the worst of how these things kind of unfold. And the reason I'm I'm so um, apprehensive about the support is because I personally haven't seen any clear understanding of strategy, of individual tactics. Even reading the 4,000-page um, congressional report on the budget spending, which you know mostly was non-defensive, is like 700 plus billion was non-defense related. Where is all this money going? And I'm like, we haven't made the clear case. Chad Robichaud, I would say, is probably two or three people in my network who are subject matter experts on Ukraine and the circumstance from the ground truth. First of all, how did you, this, for people who are just tuning in this, they don't know who the hell you are, who are you? And then how did you get involved with Ukraine? Yeah, former Force Recon Marine, uh, Jay, was spent eight deployments at, at JSOC, uh, Joint Special Operations Command, operating in Afghanistan. And uh, stood up Save Our Allies uh, for the Afghan evacs, and uh, and a president founder of Mighty Oaks Foundation as well, which you know serves uh, our military and first responder communities dealing with resiliency and and uh, recovery uh, mm -hmm. from from hardships like PTSD, anxiety, depression, suicide, all those things. And so uh, that's that's what I do for a living. Um, when uh, Ukraine kicked off, I knew um, you know we had the ability to help there. I was like, like you're saying, very confused about what was going on. You know, who's the good guys? Originally, it was who's the good guys? Who's the bad guys? Like, uh, you know, there's so much propaganda out there. What to believe and what not. To, and the, it's very good propaganda. Like, so what, what, what not to believe? And so, uh, I originally went to Ukraine in in February. The invasion was February 24th. Uh, we had a guy on the ground uh, at, on February 15th in Ukraine. So he was there when the invasion happened. Sea spray. We talked about it in the last podcast. Uh, and, and he's, you know, very experienced guy, uh, from, 
you know, from the from the Army, from Green Beret and the unit, and, and uh, over at uh, at Ground Branch at, at the um, you know paramilitary organization for the uh, OGA, and so very experienced guy, and so we we uh, wanted to be there to help uh, do things that other people couldn't do. Um, that's that's why we originally went there. Uh, we didn't want to get involved in the politics of it. Um, I'll still say to this day, like people get people have been me give me a hard time because I went there ten times now. Why are you going over there? Zawinski's corrupt. Uh, and, you know, we're spending all this money there. I don't care about any of that, personally. Uh, I, I do I do care about those things. Personally, that's not why I'm there. Uh, Zawinski's corrupt. I probably would agree. Uh, so is our president. <laughs> so is so is a lot of people in Washington, D.C. It doesn't mean we don't help people. I, I don't care about Zawinski. I don't care about Ukraine as a country. I care about people. And I had the opportunity to help people. Mm. There are uh, innocent people in Ukraine that don't know about this war as much as you and I do and, and are, are victims of, of it. And I can tell you firsthand, and I know we're going to talk about some of the firsthand testimony I've seen on the battlefield and front lines of Ukraine. These people, so I cared about people. Uh, and so I think when we went there, it was, it was we went with the notion, and I remember uh, Seaspray saying this, what makes special operations special? Uh, the word, you get the word special and special operations or special forces. What makes them special? Uh, what makes us special is that we do things that other people can't do. Um, that's what makes us special. If there's something that other people can do, then you let them do it and you go do something special that other people can't do. In Afghanistan, we got 17,000 people out, mass evacuation. In Ukraine, people are driving their cars, their buses over, they open the doors, people are getting in. We didn't need to do mass evacuations. We need to be able to do precision rescue operations where people that other people couldn't do in areas that other people couldn't get to. Uh, and so that's where we originally went there to do. Uh, one of the advac uh, rescues we did was Benjamin Hall, the Fox News reporter. Uh, if you remember Benjamin Hall, uh, some, if you, people have seen the story, he was catastrophically wounded when the Russians tried to take Ky Kiev. And we were all sitting in our, in our safe house. And I remember uh, we had just got our, our, some of the vehicles that gave us access to these areas within an hour. And we got a call from both from someone from the Pentagon and from Fox News saying, we had a Fox News reporter, uh, first time it had happened in the history of Fox that something like this had happened, even through Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and, uh, and uh, Benjamin Hall, they didn't know at the time if he was, uh, who was killed, but they knew Benjamin Hall was alive and he was catastrophically wounded and he probably had hours to live. And they said, the U.S. military is not going to get him. Ukraine doesn't have the resources to allocate towards one American. And so you guys are the only people that could go if you don't go. He's going to die. And, uh, and so I remember Seaspray giving the brief to everyone in the house and saying, hey, we, we set up for this. Uh, Kiev is under attack right now by the Russians. He's in a contested area. Uh, this guy has a wife ho at home, uh, has two daughters, and uh, he's an American. And if we don't go get him, he, he's going to die. And uh, not, no one in that room uh, hesitated and was like, let's go get him. And so we, uh, we went into Kiev that night. Uh, Dakota Myers was uh, happened to be in the house at that time. Uh, uh, he he jumped in the vehicle with me. Uh, Anthony Redone, this base baseball player that's really supportive in uh, in in human trafficking evacuations, he was there. We had a uh, you know two Delta Force guys, former Delta Force guys, and uh, and another Army guy, uh, and we had two doctors that we had there. Both were surgeons. One came from the J, J Mile unit, which people that don't know what J Mile is, it's like the premier special mm -hmm. operations surgical team. Uh, and so we broke up into two assets and we went in, uh, and we went into the city. I, I was the lead on one vehicle. Mr. C Spray was the lead on the other. C Spray's went, went in, they, they got to him and, uh, I don't want to go all over all his industry in, in, in injuries. Uh, but he was missing limbs. He was in bad shape, missing an eye, uh, shrapnel in some very vital organs, parts of his body. They had no, uh, no meds there for him. No morphine or anything. He was on drip ibuprofen. Uh, and uh, and he wasn't gonna make it, and so this kind of I get this argument ensued uh, if we were about to take him or not, and we were like, hey, we're doctors, and we just basically took him <laughs> from from a Ukrainian hospital uh, and uh, and got him in a vehicle, and I can't say exactly there's some confidentiality uh, of how we got him out of the country, but we got him across the border uh, uh, and got to Poland, and we got across the border to Poland. We had their uh, the the GRU, you know who the GRU is yeah, where the GRU help us cross. It's their tier one. Yeah, Special like forces their, their unit. CAG unit. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they helped us actually at the border. So no one helped us still get the border, got to the border, got them across. And when we got across, the 82nd Airborne was waiting on the Poland side with a helicopter. 
loaded him on a helicopter, flew him to an airfield, got him on an aeromedical unit, and flew to uh, launch drill, and then eventually to San Antonio, where he's doing well now. Um, and but but one of the things that happened with that was uh, Fox News course uh, Fox uh, News um, local correspondent Sasha. The only thing left of her was a piece of her arm. The two security drivers were nothing was left of them. And a 25 year Fox new cameraman Pierre, who did a lot of stuff in Afghanistan, just an amazing dude, combat correspondent. He was uh, he was fatally wounded. He took a piece of shrapnel through his leg and bled out. And uh, they wanted us to go back and get him. We had decided we wouldn't because we wouldn't want to put human life in danger for going get a body. And then Michelle, his wife, showed up in Poland and was like, I want my husband. And we were a bunch of softies. And we were like, well, we'll get him. And so we went back and got him. I actually drove a hearse with him in the back. From We got there and like he's in his hearse and he had his Irish flag because he's, he's Irish. It was thrown in the back. And so I remember like we pu- pulled open the, ca- the coffin and seen his body in there. So we confirmed it was him. And then, you know, w- when we have our U.S. service members... We always put the, the blue at the head, stripes go down to the feet. So I looked on Google how, how you do Irish flag and it's the green, white, orange. We did it the right way, made it, you know, put him, put some dignity behind it. And then, uh, and then uh, the hearse driver was like, we we're going to put this, her- take his casket out and put it in the, in the ambulance we had. And it would have been like, just kind of, we would have had to ratchet strap it. And I was like, you know what? Like, we're taking this hearse. And as I asked the guy, I was, it's like, hey, how much do you want to sell your hearse for? And he's like, no, it's not for sale. And uh, I'm like, no, you don't understand either. Either you're going to get on the phone right now with Fox News and make a really good deal or uh, get the deal of a lifetime or, or we're, we're, we're stealing your hearse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so he got a, he got, I'm sure he got a pretty good deal for that hearse. And, uh, and we got uh, Pierre back to his, uh, to his wife. And so that was the kind of example of how we started. We helped some, uh, you guys participated. I think Amber, uh, Amber mm-hmm. came out on, uh, and we, uh, we moved some, some handicapped kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, that were that were caught in a bombing. They were the survivors of 150. There was about 40, I think 45 of them left, um, and got, got got them moved. We, we did a lot of things in the beginning, rescue wise, but then I seen a, a shift for the uh, for the need of, of resiliency in these troops. Because what a lot of people don't realize is the Ukrainian troops that are like most of the military there are everyday civilian that not only just got drafted, but just said we need to fight for our homes, our family, our freedom. And uh, and they don't have a lot of training. And they uh, were just handed gun. It was the, that was the videos of them being yeah. handed weapons from the armory, the local armories. Yeah, and, just, and they're just like, "Hey, you're it." Yeah, you're it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, go fight and teach them how to fam fire the weapon, and and they're out there doing it. And then, so, not only do they not get a lot of training, but uh, but they don't know, you know, mentally and emotionally and and spiritually, like how to be a be a warrior. And so that's what Mighty Oaks does well, my foundation. And we've done it well for U.S. service members. And we, we started an international program in 2016. And we have been to Ukraine before uh, and, and before the war because of 2014. And we went there. So we moved out, started moving our Mighty Oaks teams in there to go bring to the front lines and provide mental and spiritual resiliency for them uh, from U.S. combat service veterans who have been through hard times, fell in their face, got back up again, and had the desire to go help. And, uh, and to do that, we, uh, we said we can't just go up there, show up there and be like, hey, we want to teach you how to mentally and spiritually prepare to do this. Let's give them something tangible. So we made a medical effort, provided them with medical supplies, and, uh, and then teaching them. And so one of the things that uh, you know, Fieldcraft, your company, did was help train our team, first of all, to go out there and get them spun up on some current medical and driving and all that stuff. And then, uh, and then one of your doctors who uh, you know, had... Sh- you know, incredible training of training uh, doctors came out there with us. And we, uh, that was just one example of one of our missions. We've had plenty since, but going out there and, and giving them medical supplies, instead of giving them medical supplies and looking at this, like it's foreign and alien to them. They're like, okay, here's how you put on a tourniquet. Here's how you treat a sucking chest wound uh, with the, with this gear. Here's how you, you know, deflate a uh, over, over compressed lung. Um, here's how you do all these things. Here you, how you put a trach in. And so we give them this medical equipment, teach them how to use it. And then, and then that brings the rapport with them. We spend time with them and bed with them, live with them, and give them the mental and spiritual resiliency classes that we do. Uh, we bring audio Bible sticks out there, giving away over you know thousands of audio Bible sticks and resources, and just there to just support them. Uh, food, candy, everybody loves candy. Went out in the field, butt wipes, stuff mm-hmm. like that. And uh, so just being out there and and, and helping uh, helping them. Um, again, that's not anything to do with. Helping to win scary is this is these are people and uh, and these people just don't deserve what's happening to them. Well, what's your yeah. overall sense of the political situation and how it's evolved tactically? Mm-hmm. I, I one of the things that's on a recent podcast I talked about the breakdown 
of the finances as allocated mm -hmm. uh, all the way back to the original uh, culminated $68 billion that we gave. And I was going line by line. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's hard to decipher. And I'm like, man, this is so much money and so much support. If you look at the numbers comparative to Afghanistan, for it's, example. It's more money than we were spending. Uh, equal to or more money than we were spending in Afghanistan, U.S. military. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And so what what is your overall sense of where Americans' taxpayers' dollars are going? Do you see that money funneling in? Do you get the impression that it's doing good, that it's making effective change? Because it's hard to track because yeah. it depends on the news agency that's reporting it. It's hard to get an understanding of where we, we're at in the war and what's the end game. Yeah, so surprisingly to some of your listeners, I, I agree with you. We should not be giving them this money. As much as I have a heart for those people and being there on the ground, I have a heart for these people, we should not be giving them this money. One, one is too much money. And, uh, and I don't think by accident, there's no congressional oversight of this money on the ground. Yeah, it's just and funneled in. It's funneled in. Yeah. And uh, and so we don't do that. As I mean, Americans should never do that. American taxpayers' money should never be given away in the billions of dollars with no oversight. We have, and I can't say who, we have personally, and I, I we have personally taken U.S. Congress members on the, the good guys in the Ukraine to see, to come to the front line and have first eyewitness testimony without their security details, just in a passenger in a car with us, driving to the front line to see that money's not getting there because they want to see for themselves that money is not giving. If, if that money was getting to the front lines, I would not have any raise. I, I, last time, I think we brought $20,000 in IFAC kits, individual first aid kits. Mm -hmm. Some of them, you know, Field from, from you guys. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we're getting those to the front lines. Uh, why, why am I'm a nonprofit? Why we're giving them billions of dollars and I'm having to bring these to the front lines. Mm. There's people out there with paintball gear on for, for PPE, for personal protection equipment. Like, wow. I mean, so why, why are we, you know, now, you know, I see I see some evidence uh, of some, I mean, I've never seen it about it. I've, I've counted probably now, uh, I personally counted probably like 50 tanks, Russian tanks, that were uh, burnt to the ground. The only thing left is parts of the tracks that are from Stingers. I've never seen that in a battlefield before anywhere. So that's cool to see that. But as far as the money goes, you know, I think most of this money has ended up in the pockets of uh, uh, corrupt the corrupt in Ukraine, which we know Ukraine has a, you know, track record of track record of corruption, and we know Ukraine has a track record of corruption that leads money back to Washington D.C. So I think a lot of this money's ended up in the pockets uh, pockets in D.C. That's my personal, uh, very strong personal opinion. And uh, and the problem that creates by giving that much money is one, it, there, there's no incentive by whoever's corrupt in D.C. There's no incentive to end this because now it's filling the pockets of uh, of corrupt in, in Ukraine. So that takes away their incentive to end the war. It takes away their incentive of U.S. politicians to end the war, and it takes away the incentive of all the neocon warmongers in, 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 uh, in the industrial military complex who are making millions and billions of dollars off of this war going on in Ukraine. It takes away all the incentives. So when you start throwing money at a problem, people want that problem to continue because the money keeps coming. I am very surprised to hear you say this. Like, I, yeah. not that we've talked about it before, yeah. Yeah. but, like, that is exactly how most people intelligent people feel mm -hmm. about the money yeah. and and you, you know someone who's been literally i mean you're sending me videos on in the front line like not on it in it like yeah. behind it i think i think i sent you some videos of like russian soldiers dying oh yeah because yeah, we're, you're we're, like rolling through a gunfight yeah yeah and, i mean i mean it, uh as as long as this money is coming in that levels the people who are who are the the movers and shakers who control the levers on this will ne are not going to want to end it because it cuts off the money. Yeah, they need. They, yeah, I mean, which is likely when you look at an Afghan campaign with no clear objectives or objectives that were skewed right. to a withdrawal. It's like we're doing the same thing we did in the '80s with Afghanistan, in the '90s with Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. All these things were literally doing the same exact thing over and over again. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and like I said, my heart breaks for these people to the point to where I've gotten on that plane 10 times and flown over there, taking the— Risking your life. Yeah, I mean, I mean I've mean, i been—like you said, I've been to you know, Kharkiv and, 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 uh, and I, in Zoom. I was just in a Zoom. Uh, my last trip, I was in a Zoom. Which is north of Kiev, Kiev right? It's, it's, it's uh, east of Kiev— uh, it's where the Russian front line is. The Russian had to occupy it for six months. So I was with the military unit as they retook it. And then we went two hours past, and the Russian line closed behind us. 
Wow. Uh, and uh, so you're trapped behind. Trapped behind, and, and just me, me and one other guy, me and C Spray, and uh, and uh, and literally like we were driving, and and all of a sudden, whew, whew, two fast movers move over us, and I'm like, were well, those MIGs? And he's like, those are MIGs, and I'm like, I've never been. This is a first for me, and he's like, it's first for me. I've never been. I've been in all over by myself, but I've never been under enemy air before. I mean, we've always controlled the air. Yeah. Two MIGs, and and those MIGs zip back around and dropped, did a gun run on the other side of tree line, and uh, and we keep moving. We've been in bed with them, and we're outside talking, and literally we had we had uh, IDF in, indirect indirect fire uh, landing within a hundred meters of us. Guys, you, you could I could hear the, the springs and people's you know weapons uh, that close, and you know and uh, and then like I said, I think we, that video I sent you I had about sixty Russian soldiers dead or dying, and. Uh, as we're moving forward, and I remember took I took the rifle off of one Russian because he's like dying still. It has a rifle, and the Ukrainian guys already passed him. I'm like, man, what if he gets up and like a bad yeah. movie, right? So I they haven't cleared took the, the guns out, cleared the gun, landed against the wall, and and uh, I, I definitely didn't want him you know, to be walking around, you know, carrying an AK there. I, there was no need for me to if I needed one. There's be plenty. There was plenty laying around. Yeah, but uh, but you know, just cleared that weapon and moved in. And the reason we were there was to identify these mass grave sites because there's so much pop propaganda. Our government agencies, and you know, mention who, but um, our government agencies don't aren't going to send people. We're not sending people. If, you, if people think that there's like, oh, the U.S. the U.S. military has like secret effort out there in Ukraine helping, no, there's not. Yeah. Uh, so they won't go. They won't cross that border. And and uh, and so like our, our our government agencies, are like, what's really happened? Is there really mass graves? We take the Ukrainians' word for it because they just want more money because they're because we're throwing it at them. And so we were able to go and identify two mass grave sites in a zoom, uh, you know, one, a thousand people, one, 500 people and, uh, and, and give me eyewitness testimony. It was on Fox news. Uh, we reported it. And, um, who were those people that were in the mass graves? 500, mostly women and children. Uh, Are you serious? Yeah. And he's, and, and uh, most of them were bound. Um, now I don't think at one time, I, I, I don't, I mean, I wasn't there when they were killed, but their level of decomposition was different. So I don't think they were killed at one time. His zoom was occupied for six months. So I think these would have been like problem makers, uh, families, of families, people, they who people were... yeah, and uh, so they just by over time, and then you could tell they tried to as as the zoom was getting uh, taken back by Ukrainians, you could tell they tried to bury it up and they even tried to burn bodies, which is you need a lot of fuel to burn bodies, and then they uh, and so they tried to cover it up, but cover up atrocities. Yeah. Now, w when I immediately when I see that, or when I hear it from you, I I don't just think it's Russians. I also think about. Ukraine, because Ukraine has a history of utilizing secret police, mm -hmm. internal affairs to deal with people who are sympathizers to yeah. the Russian uh, yeah. state. Is do you, do you have any evidence of that? Is that something that happens? I have no evidence of that. I've heard it a lot, of course. Um, this area would have been Russians, and because uh, one, this was the, this was in in the middle of all their tank. Muckers. This yeah. is where Russian tanks were born. Russians had occupied this area for they were embedded there for six months. Oh. So this was a this would have been Russians that would So they're been. killing civilians they're for killing six civilians. months. In addition to that, I mean, and I have video evidence of this too, like the the apartment buildings and the houses. Like I've been in I've been to elderly communities that are like, you know, like our here where we live, like sixty plus community. Yeah. Leveled, rubble to the ground. No military targets in sight. I I, I put some video on my social on my Instagram that had a these apartment buildings, there was these four apartment buildings that would have occupied probably like 3,000 people each. And, uh, and, and they had an a impact from the roof. They were four stories tall, blown from the roof. You, in my video looks like it's two apartment buildings, but it's one because they blown from the roof all the way to the ground. And, uh, and all four of these apartment buildings were hit in the same spot from the air. Uh, which is not indiscriminate fire. It's not accidental. When yeah. you, and, and these aren't, there's no military in sight. So, and these, these were occupied, by the way. And you know playgrounds outside, and so, so they're you know deliberately targeting civilians. And speaking to the, the Ukrainian troops on the ground, they said they'll engage the Russians, and the Russians will literally flee, redirect, and instead of come back and attack them, they'll go attack a, a civilian site. Now, which sounds as horrific, retaliation as retaliation, it sounds horrific. But if you're trying to beat people, uh, you, you're trying to beat people mentally. And you're like, she keeps trying to fight him, but man, they're not killing us. They're not fighting us. They're killing my wife and kids back home. Yes. That will demoralize and break break a people. Interesting. And, and so this is the tactic that the Russians are using. Uh, hey, I'm, why, why fight? 
Wi-Fi, you guys Hard targets. Missiles. Hit the soft targets. Yeah, you guys are going to eventually quit because you're going to be tired of us killing your women and children. Jeez, and your elderly. Man. And, they, and they're literally doing that. And I've seen it firsthand. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it, you, it's, it's and, heartbreaking. And the 500 and the 1,000, the mass graves that you identified, were were the people intentionally executed or killed that way? Or was it more of the bombing and the bodies and then the, trying to drag the civilians back into the grave sites to cover up? Them bombing soft targets. Well, no, these uh, most of the people in these in these mass graves are bound. Oh my uh, god! So, uh, so which would indicate, and they were shot. So I seen, I didn't see, you know, thousands of people with gunshot wounds, but I seen a few. Uh, you know, with, 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 with I mean, I seen a few that they sh- they showed to me. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're shot in the back and and uh, in the front, and you know, not not just shooting, uh, but yeah, bound and the hands tied behind, hands tied behind their back and and pushed in the hole. And one of the things. I, I tried to fundraise for you for the international side yeah. of Mighty Oaks Foundation. I'm a board member of Mighty Oaks. It's been hard to raise for Ukraine. I was just going to say, raise money. like I've gone to some of the the guys in my network who are profound givers, mm-hmm. and as soon as I mentioned Ukraine, and this is like I, I didn't realize how controversial Ukraine was. Yeah, and and like you. I get the controversy, but I don't care because yeah. I care about the people, right? right? It doesn't matter. Name the country. Rwanda. Yeah. I, I care about the people who were killed in the genocide, right. not the political nature of the situation. Right. So when I I was really surprised at how much people were not willing to donate to any causes, especially yours, which is all, I always think about your causes on the up and up. I know a lot of organizations who are not on the up and up. Right. Um, and I always your your organization, Mighty Oaks, Save Our Allies, to me stands for integrity. And it's a faith based organization, and it's something I would get behind. Why why is this the case with Ukraine outside of the the obvious? I think I think people get sucked. Up. I mean, propaganda is real and it's good, and uh, and and you get the mainstream media who uh, who don't understand it, and uh, and 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 report safely because they don't they don't have the eyes on the ground to really understand it. Instead of reporting from a thirty thousand foot view, and uh, and they're not getting in the weeds and, and and reporting on the people, they're reporting on the politics of it. I mean, you know, if you look at all the media on Ukraine, it's going to be, it's going to be on the, the the billions of dollars. It's going to be on the corruption. It's going to be all, you know, all the high level stuff. But no one's really getting in there and doing the stories on the people. Uh, and and uh, and so it's it's really easy um, for people here in America to lose a heart for the reality of helping people, you know, and, 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 uh, and it's I tell disgusting. you, like, I, I've been, I've been like, not just, uh, not support it, but I've been attacked and, and, and even had the question like, man, do I still want to do this? And I'm like, yep, cause it's the right thing to do. But I've been attacked for supporting Ukraine. And the only defense people have, the only attack people have is like, Zawinski's corrupt, Ukraine's corrupt. And, I'm, and my retaliation is, I don't care. I'm not supporting them. I'm supporting the people. How can you lose heart for the people? If, if there was a little baby, uh, on this table right here, choking to death, I mean, would there be no no question that you and I would get over there, would you know do whatever we had to do to to save that person? If the house, your neighbor's house was burning, was burning, I think most people would run in that burning house to to help. But how far does something have to be away from you to where you lose your compassion for people? That's what scares me, Chad. I, I saw the post you did on that child that was killed. And people attacked me, right? And, and, well, people, I, I don't think it's necessarily personally attacking you, right? It's attacking the position, right? right. And when I saw that, the disturbing thing for me was the position and morality that people took mm. um, as Americans, right? America has always been the good guys, right? right? We've always been the guys to go bail out countries. I, I'm, I'm a product of the South Korean occupation mm-hmm. to be able to protect a, a geographical location of people who are being oppressed by the North Koreans and the Chinese. And so, and the, and the Japanese as well. When I look at those comments, especially the ones that were saying, they literally were conspiracizing that the baby wasn't killed mm-hmm. because no baby, like me and you have seen dead babies in combat, right? right? I know what a dead baby looks like. And people were like, well, a, a baby, that baby doesn't have any shrapnel. So that's fake. It's like yeah. fake news. And you're like, what? <laughs> like, have you, have you, have you people ever seen just pictures or photos of war? People died. That child could have took one section, one piece of shrapnel, or died from concussion, yeah, concussion. from blast. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people were so egregiously battling and arguing. And when I read that post, 
outside of the other things that I've read from social media and all of these so-called professionals acting like children, when I read that, it made me lose faith in humanity. Because I look at our country and I go, our society society has always been deeply rooted in doing the right thing. But now we don't even want to do the right thing. And now it's controversial to do the right thing. Yeah. How, how do you feel about all of those things as it, it seems to get worse? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, I, had, I just got back like I was like a week back from that area. And then my buddy sent me that picture. I didn't get that picture off the Internet. It wasn't a news clip. That was like my buddy took it with his iPhone, of this dead baby from the village I was just in. Not, uh, and, and I was like, and, and I, I wanted to share that people. I want people to see what's, what's the reality what's really, yeah. going on there. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's disheartening, man. It, it really is. And it's not only disheartening because uh, – because it's not about me, it, it, it's scary for our country. Because this is coming from Americans, like, and it, and it seems to be systemic with uh, within our culture that people just have lacked compassion for people. I mean, um, the same thing in Afghanistan. I mean, uh, I mean, I couldn't get a news, I couldn't get a news uh, outlet to talk about the the child brides taken taken off again in Afghanistan, uh, and. You know, it's, it's it's just scary for our culture. Now, I will say that I will say that on the flip side, there are still people doing good things. I mean, when you go to the border in Ukraine um, early, especially early on, it w- it was pretty encouraging to see like not one government in the entire world, including our own, was on that border as people was was fleeing the mass flee fleeing of of Ukraine. But there were NGOs from all over the world. There was a there was a hospital set up on that border that was shared. By Germans and Jews, <laughs> which I wow. thought was pretty cool. They're they're on the border, uh, and and serving together. German, if you think about the history, right? Of course. Germans, Germans and Jews, like uh, Israel, in, sharing a field hospital. Uh, there was people there. There was people from India, with a hot bowl of cauliflower curry when he came across the border. People with SIMS cards because hey, you're in Poland now. You need a SIM card to get a hold of your family. Uh, here's a charger for your for your battery, uh, for your phone. Here's I, I drove down here with my car. His three empty seats. Get in the car. I'm gonna drive you somewhere. Like there were piles of coats and and warm clothes and and everything. It was like just people. It was this dude in the piano. I posted it. He 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 drove and uh, pulled a grand piano from Germany, parked it on the border, and he had it, it was freaking freezing cold there. I mean, it's so cold there in the wind. So it's like zero degrees, wind whipping. And this guy's sleeping in his car, playing the piano. The, 24 seven and he's probably breaking to sleep. He's praying. Imagine, you know, imagine all the people as these people come across the border. I go and talk to him. Like, what are you doing here? He's like, I'm playing the piano. I'm like, no, what are you, what are you doing here? He's like, well, these, you know, women and children heard like bombs and bullets. And I want them to come across and hear something beautiful. I'm like, so there's those people too, you know, that go, there's, there's still those people in the world. So yeah, when I get, when I hear all these people that are sitting back in their comfortable environment on Facebook and Instagram rattling stuff that off that they know nothing about. I try to think about those people that, you know, uprooted themselves and went sit on that cold border to do the right thing yeah. and, and be there for their fellow human. Yeah. You can't call you a virtue signaler because you're literally doing it. You're not, you're not virtue signaling anything. You're literally on the ground. Yeah. You're not a news reporter in a studio talking about something that you have no experience with. you, are putting your money, your your mouth where your, where your money is. I mean, yeah. you're literally doing the thing. Um, I, I find it unfortunate, but you know, that's just the nature of kind of the world we live in today. Yeah, and social media, right? Because yeah, I think Mike Tyson has the best quote. Like you get, everybody's. Everybody's tough until you get punched in the mouth. One hundred percent. I mean, and people don't know Chad's background. Like you, you got paid to punch people in the mouth, right? Yeah. You were a professional MMA fighter. I mean, people, for years. people sit on Instagram. It's real easy to sit on Instagram and, and say whatever you want, right? Yeah. And uh, you, and then you know, I've had a few people. I, I, I've seen Tim with a few people. You know, you know, Tim, Tim would smash me, but people bash Tim, and then they meet him out in public, and they're like, "Hey, can I get a picture?" <laughs> like with Tim. And- <laughs> yeah, because Tim would maul you to death. He's like, yeah, he he's me. literally a gorilla. He mauled me the other day. Did he? Like, oh yeah. And <laughs> you mauled me, so I know Tim could maul me. Oh man, I was like, I was like, geez. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy when when all these people talk crap about all these dudes. And then Garden like, Ryan mauls mauls Tim. Yeah, you, I'm like, you think dude. you're tough until you, yeah, you know, there's, there's levels until he puts yeah. his hands on you yeah. and he crushes you. Yeah, Tim, um, Tim's a little bigger than me. <laughs> yeah, Tim's a big boy. He's like a gorilla, man. He's like a silverback. Yeah, um, one of the best dudes I I know on the planet. Um, when I when I 
see all this controversy and everything, what's been alarming to me is the media position with conservative outlets taking almost seemingly the side of the Russians. And, and, and you know, that that's very subjective of me to say, but yeah, basically but... they're they're stating that Ukraine is in fact very corrupt, which I get. That's a that's a thing that's known, but also that they're fighting neo Nazi fascist in Ukraine. Is there any evidence of that from your experiences that the men on the ground, especially the the guys fighting on the front line, are neo Nazi or fascist? Yeah. So you said two things there. Uh, one, I'll uh, answer first is that uh, even if even if the case is right, and I, and I believe it is that 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 Ukraine is a corrupt nation, that gives no other country, neighboring country, the right to roll in there with, and fire ballistic missiles into mm -hmm. a, civilian, civilian buildings, civilian buildings yeah. or try to just take the country because they're corrupt. There's no right now, and it's, this is you know 2022. You don't you don't have the right to do that. You can't use chemical weapons on civilians. These are war crimes, and uh, that are not being addressed. By the way, uh, the fact that the const the the question of neo Nazism in Ukraine, I, I won't say it doesn't exist. Uh, I because I, I, because I don't know. Uh, I can only say this is that I've been pretty much in every town on the eastern border and seen troops fighting. I have yet to see one uh, neo Nazi patch. Or uh, or a flag, I have not yet to see uh, anyone promoting that. So I've seen no evidence of it. Now, and people are like I've seen guys in uniforms and patches. If we had a civil, if we had a, a militia rise up in the United States and, and took action, and and this was something like this was going to the United States, if if one person put a Confederate flag on their PPE, that would be that would be everybody would know about it, right? It would be like the big deal. And that's kind of like I think. So did somebody did somebody in Ukraine do that? Are there people that are doing that? Yeah, and that's just that that one picture of it's getting pushed out. Yeah, but that's propaganda. But it's, it's propaganda. Yeah. But I haven't seen it. Like I said, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. The Ukrainian people I met have been warm, kind people, very hospitable to me, uh, and uh, of course, because they're helping them, I, I get that. But uh, they they've been uh, probably some of the better people I've met in all my travels of the world, just like really, really just good people that all they want is their simple way of life. These are like in the Eastern front talking very simple lifestyles, like, like farmland, like people that just want to be left alone. They don't care about all this stuff. Yeah. They don't care about the corruption. They, they don't peace. care about neo-Nazism. Yeah. They don't, they they don't, don't, don't want fancy. They don't want money. No. They just want to live their, milk, life in their peace. goats and their cows and, and, and you know, their crops and, and be left alone. They don't care about this stuff. And, uh, they don't, they don't, they don't care about the neo-Nazism and stuff like that. It's not, that's not the people who are, who, who are getting, who are suffering. So I personally hadn't seen any evidence of it. Uh, I think most of it is, is probably propaganda. Does it exist? It exists everywhere. Um, mm. you know, but, uh, if any of that's the case, there's still at the end of the day, Russia has no right to cross that border and, and do the things they've done. And by the way, uh, chemical weapons is not a conspiracy. I have personally, I can't say how, uh, and I, I'll tell you off air, but I, I can tell you that that uh, I personally know of, of three cities and five different chemical weapons used on civilians. Uh, I personally, and people can believe me or not, but uh, I have personal evidence of, of that. Wow, man. So Wow. How do you see this unfolding in the future? It has to get worse. Uh, the way it's cur currently cornered, it has to get worse before we get better. Um, NATO... Uh, NATO uh, won't participate unless they're forced to participate. They're trying to avoid participating. Yeah, you know, Article Five has to be violated uh, uh, for them to participate, um, and it, and it, they're they're, they're going to try to avoid it, uh, avoid that at all cost. Um, we just gave them, we just gave Ukraine Patriot missile systems mm -hmm. that they're using in country. I assume they've been using them for a while now. Yeah. Do you see a potential for? I mean, Tulsi Gabbard thinks that we could be on the brink of World War III because only a couple things need to happen yeah. before the United Nations declares war on well, Russia. Well, here's the problem with how the United States is handling it. I mean, we are at we are in a proxy war. The United States is in a proxy war with Russia right now. Yeah, we're not even hiding it. Yeah, it's not even hiding it. So now we've 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 entered into a war with Russia, but we have no control of what happens. If we were actually saying, okay, we chose, I'm not saying we should choose or choose not to be at war with Russia, but if we're going to choose to be at war, shouldn't we be in control? 
uh, now we've we're chose to be in war with Russia and we're given the weapons to Ukrainians to do what they want to with it. So they could provoke something that we're going to have to deal with the repercussions with. If if President Biden would have not have moved uh, U.S. troops out of Ukraine, I, I am convinced Putin would have never crossed that border. Yeah, because if he did and then he launched a missile into Ukraine and they killed an American, that would have been... Yeah, yeah, yeah that would have been NATO it. NATO steps in, it's, it's over. Uh, if, if if NATO, if if instead of writing a blank check to Ukraine, if the president had the had the had the leadership to go stand in front of NATO and say enough is enough, uh, ballistic missiles cannot be fired at civilians, chemical weapons cannot be fired on civilians. These are war crimes. We need to we need to move. Uh, do they want them to join NATO? Ukraine to join NATO or not? That's a different conversation. Uh, but we need to move NATO in there because these are war crimes. Uh, and and move NATO, a NATO coalition into Ukraine. It would be over tomorrow. Uh, uh, I think economically sanctioning could tied with that could end this thing tomorrow. They don't want it to end. Uh, but while they don't want it to end it, they want it to continue because people are filling their, their coffers, uh, financial coffers off of this thing. They, they are, they are uh, also entering the United States into a proxy war with Russia, and, uh, and, as, and, and we have no control of what's happening. And, it, and Tulsi Gabbard's right. It could end very badly. It could escalate very quickly. And we're on the brink of that. We have no control over it. Well, on that and this idea of resilience and working through adversity, I'm curious – Personally, and and for the audience, what drives you to do this, um, and and what is the future for you, your organization, and Ukraine look like? Personally, it's been a very complex thing for me because uh, Mighty Oaks is my heart. That's what my my priority in my life is Mighty Oaks Foundation. Uh, you know, twelve years ago, a guy called me to do that, and uh, it's been extremely successful. We've served over four hundred and fifty thousand active duty troops in our resiliency programs. We had forty five hundred people come through our recovery programs been able to affect policy in dc uh but our international efforts important too um i didn't i didn't anticipate to be where i am right now and and uh you know i'm always pretty transparent uh i tell you you know my wife says i had a lot of conversations we were leaving for afghanistan at river operation my wife was not happy about it uh the evac she was super cool with but when going to the the river operation she was like why are you going to do this like what are you why and the only thing i could say to her to help her understand why we're doing it is and this kind of been on my mind is what if it was us, you know, what if it was, you know, for Afghanistan, what if it was my daughter that was going to be raped by the Taliban for the rest of her life or my sons that'd be pushed into madrasas to become terrorists. And what if it was us, wouldn't we be praying that someone would come help us? And, uh, we would, and I would, I would be like, man, somebody come like somebody that's has the ability to help. I wish they would come help us. And, uh, and so I, I felt, uh, this burden over the last few, the last two years of being involved in all this, that, you know, God's burdened me to do it. He's opened doors that are kind of impossible to be open and hadn't closed those doors and created opportunities that, uh, that I've been able to step through and, uh, and has positioned me to both. And when I say position me to both to do it, I don't mean like, like, um, some special operations guru that has, but I mean, when I say position me to do it, I mean like the networks, the responsibilities, the relationships that I've had. Built Capability, leverage, capacity. Leverage, yeah. Leverage yeah. those things to do that. I'm not saying that like, I'm like the guy, cause there's a lot of guys special operation backgrounds far beyond mine may way more capable of me. I mean like organization, I have the ability to organize some of these things. And so it's really compelled me that, you know, right now I have the opportunity to do this. Other people aren't, uh, God's given me this, these, all these attributes and, and I just feel obligated to do it. I don't trust me. There's a lot of other things I want to be doing and be focused on. Uh, I want to be home a little bit. I've, I've, I've you know, me like jujitsu is like my passion. Like, man, I've, I, I, my whole life, I've been doing jiu-jitsu since I was five years old. I'm 47 now, so 42 years on the mat. Probably the least training I've I've had I've done outside of the year I became a recon marine was uh, this last year. I love I love training, but I mean it's just you know I've, I have to give up give up a lot, which sounds stupid giving up your jiu-jitsu for people's lives. But but you know I'm giving up a lot of personal stuff. I'm I'm having a lot of people at Mighty Oaks having to cover my load for things. I'm 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 passing up you know financial opportunities business wise and you know I. I sp- I'm not speaking as much as normally about public speaking. So, you know, it's, but, uh, I just feel right now, this is an opportunity for me to be able to do something that, uh, you know, uh, that God's given me the ability to do. And, are uh, you slowing down at all? Or are you, yes. are you going to slow down? Every, everything I do in my life, uh, and I could tell you, you're kind of the same way as me. Um, I always try to, I, I'm always like the, the kind of lead. I always go in business development, set things up and then bring in somebody behind me that, uh, 
uh, that can learn what I do and then hand it off and yeah. go on the next thing. That's how I, that's how I've done everything in my, in my professional life. And, and uh, so with this, this last year in Ukraine, I've been building a team. Uh, we have our Mighty Oaks International Vision, building a team, putting people in place, and 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 doing a handoff process. And so right now, you know, I was going to Ukraine every month. I didn't go. I didn't go last month. Um, and I and I won't go in. I probably won't go in January. Uh, so. Uh, I pretty much have the ability to hand it off. I have a ground team there that's that's there permanently. I have one one U.S. person there permanently, uh, and I have four Ukrainians there that work for us that are there. Uh, and then I have uh, I have uh, about ten guys back in the states that are Mighty Oak staff members that are trained about to go there. And we talk about resiliency because I know we're talking about resiliency. I want to want to just say something that that I think is amazing, um, not related to to the topic of Ukraine, but the the team members that we have that are going there and doing this or U.S. service members that have served in combat and, and came home and struggled and going out and serving these Ukrainian guys, uh, they're going out there. They, they don't know who these people are. They're not from Ukraine. These are people they never met before, and they just have a heart to go out there and serve. And none of them, I tell you, none of them are going out there to be like, I want to go out and get into it and get into war. No, they just want to go help. Like, they really do. Um, I don't let people on our teams that are that way. They want to go out. and We've had plenty of people, like, want to go out there and fight and stuff like that. I'm like, nah, you need to go volunteer somewhere else. You know, that's not what we're doing. Uh, so premature people, but there was this guy, a uh, Reed hasty. Um, he's an ar- army veteran came through mighty Oaks about eight years ago. And I remember, uh, trying to get him to go to mighty Oaks. He, he couldn't even travel there cause his anxiety was so bad. He couldn't get on the plane. I mean, this guy was in and out of the, the impatient behind the, behind the big, the thick glass getting, getting, you know, uh, sedated. Couldn't even, he talks about when he couldn't even have his shoe strings on his shoes cause he was a suicide risk. I mean, that's the, the bad, how bad his PTSD was. Came through Mighty Oaks, ended up becoming a Christian, ended up becoming one of our team leaders, uh, really took control of his PTSD, anxiety, and depression, became one of our best team leaders, and, and also became a team leader instructor. And then I'm, I'm like watching him like two months ago. He's in Ukraine on the front lines of the war, sitting down. He was a combat engineer, sitting down on a bench. Uh, and they had all these, we went to a combat engineer unit, and we're sitting down, Huddled, you could hear bombs blowing up outside, and he's got all these all these uh, Ukrainian combat engineers around him, telling him his testimony and his story. Uh, he talked about resiliency, like an ability to be able to recover. You know, we get times in our lives where we we're like broken down and feel like, man, it's gonna be this way forever. I'm gonna be broken forever. I'm never gonna get past this. You got a guy that was like couldn't even get on an airplane to go to Mighty Oaks in California. Wow. In Ukraine on the front line of the Russian war, helping people that he didn't even know. Like, yeah, that's it's, resiliency. <laughs> it, it's 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 given people a lot of purpose, yeah. mission focus, to give back to help people because that's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah, they bring that purpose back in people. Yeah. When when we um, as we close this out, how do people help the campaigns internationally and domestic for Mighty Oaks Foundation? What what's the path to giving? Well, um, Mighty Oaks Programs uh, dot org is the website. So you just Mighty Oaks Programs dot org. And uh, first of all, if you're a veteran, first responder, or spouse, and ever need any help, um, reach out. And we, you know, we have incredible programs. We'd love to help uh, you, and it's all free. We pay for everything. We do about five million dollars a year in programming, and uh, so it's all all paid for. Even your flight to the programs, uh, and it's free because it's not free to us. It's free to them. Uh, it's free because people support. So if anybody wants to support. Uh, you go to on mightyoaksprograms.org. There's a donate button. You go on a donation page, and there'll be a way to donate specifically to uh, U.S. service members on, and first responders on this side of the world. And then there's a separate donation for the international side because we want to make sure that people giving to U.S. service members their money doesn't get used somewhere they don't want it internationally. But we have a specific fund for international efforts. And uh, currently, our international efforts. Or, uh, you know, we have a couple other countries we're working in, but primarily uh, right now, because what's going to Ukraine, it's Ukraine. Awesome. Chad, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. Uh, I appreciate you. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's amazing to catch up. It's amazing to catch up with Chad Robichaud. All the links that we talked about are down below. Guys, think about supporting domestic or overseas people that are in need of help. I'm glad we cleared up a lot of things today. And uh, if you're more, more interested in finding out more about Chad Robichaud, Make sure you pick up his book, Saving Aziz, that's just come out. We have the link down below. You can read about his story of saving uh, a a man very uh, close to him and his family who's living his best life now in Texas. Um, It's an honor to know Chad, and I'm I'm super uh, humbled by having him on the podcast. Till next time, peace out, guys.